Um, if you don't know what the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance is, um, we're a coalition of farmers and growers in the state working to bring farmers together and build community to form a more diverse, successful, um, yeah, community of growers in Connecticut. Um, and as a part of that work, we do our very best to connect farmers to the service providers that can really help them um, build their work, such as all of these wonderful folks that you're about to meet from Yukon Extension. Um, so in a normal year, we would have a big event in December called Build Your Network or Our Future, which would include um, time for farmers to connect to service providers, either one-on-one -on -one or in workshops and things like that. But of course, everything this year was different due to COVID. So this too is different. We had a scaled down version of the event in December over Zoom, and then we're pairing it with this series of workshops. So as I said, access to the other workshops is in the chat. Um, and if you don't know about the new Connecticut Farmer Alliance or you're not yet on our listserv, um, it's free. You know, there's no cost to join and it's a really wonderful and supportive community. So um, you can check us out also at that link that I sent. Um, I'm really thrilled today to be with a wonderful set of representatives from Yukon Extension. I know that for me thinking about you know, starting my own farm one day um, by myself or even with friends, it's such an overwhelming proposition. There's so many things to consider. There's so many skills that you need to have as a farmer. Um, and I think when I talk to these folks from Yukon Extension, I really just remember and, and get the sense that you don't have to do it alone, that there is a whole network of support um, and programs and educational opportunities there for you as a beginning farmer, as an intermediate farmer, even as an advanced farmer. So I'm um, excited to hear a little bit about what they have to say. And um, we're gonna have four sections, one um, focusing on you know one aspect of Yukon's support services. And after each section, we will have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, but if you have any questions that occur to you while somebody's speaking, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and we'll either get to them at the end of the presentation or if it's a little thing, we can just address it in the moment. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that you all can see the slideshow. Share. Are you all seeing the, the presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so as I said, MMC, um, feel free to message me or you can email me at newctfarmers at gmail.com if you have any questions about the workshops or if you're having any um, technical difficulties in the middle of this event, you get disconnected from the Zoom for some reason. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to our presenters, starting with Mary, who is the fruit crop specialist um, over at Extension. Ready? Okay, yeah. I'm going to start go. my first slide. Yes. So I was asked to cover a little bit about the history of extension first, and then I'll talk to you about what, what I do, and what we can offer at, at UConn. So what I put up here is what USDA um, says, cooperative extension system empowers farmers, ranchers, and communities of all sizes to meet the challenges they face, adapt to changing technology, improve nutrition and food safety, prepare for and respond to emergencies and protect our environment. So that's what we have been doing. It's, it um, has evolved over the years since it's been started. It's over 100 years so far with this. So what we do in extension is we take the research that has been generated at the experiment stations and put that into knowledge, translate, translating research into knowledge, and we uh, get that information out to uh, what used to be farmers, but now it's you know the general public because we cover so many different areas. And there's also, in addition to agriculture, uh, what used to be considered home ec is now family and consumer science. Um, then for the youth, there's 4-H. There's also FNEP, which um, is the enhanced um, food, what the heck is it called? Uh, expanded food and nutrition um, education program. And that works with um, low income communities to help them um, prepare foods, learn how to prepare good, healthy meals. So if we move to the next slide. So a little bit about the background. So the Morrill Act also is called the Land-Grant College Act of 1862 and 1890. 
Congress provided grants of public land to states to finance and set up the colleges for agriculture and uh, mechanical arts. It was really originally designed to help farmers um, learn how to farm better. So it also includes 17 colleges that are predominantly um, African American and then 30 um, American Indian colleges as well. Then the Hatch Act, which of 1887, uh, is a multi-state research fund that was intended to uh, establish the agricultural research stations at each in each state. So we actually in Connecticut have two. We're the only state that has two ag research stations. We have the one uh, attached to the University of Connecticut, which is a Storrs research farm. And then we have the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station in New Haven and also with a branch in Windsor. Um, they are not together. We do work collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, the research at the ag, researchers at the Ag Experiment Station, but the Ag Experiment Station is not a part of the University of Connecticut. Then we have the Smith Lever Act, uh, which was in 1914. This one is an act passed by Congress that actually established the cooperative extension system in our country. So every land grant university um, in this country has an extension system. Um, back then there was like 3000 different counties and every single county had an office as well. In Connecticut, we have an office in every single county. Uh, some states don't have them in every county anymore, but every state still has a formal cooperative extension system in it. Um, we're again set up to disseminate um, information that's generated from the research stations. So uh, when this was originally set up, uh, probably at least 50% of uh, the US population lived out in rural America and more than 30% actually were um, producing food. They were actually working on farms. So you wanna to go to my next slide. So then we actually have um, uh, the partnership. Originally when this was set up was a partnership between county, state and federal. So we had the USDA um, provided funding for extension. The county offices provided funding as well to support the offices and then the state provided funds. So we had a three-way partnership as, which is why it cooperative is part of the name of cooperative extension. A lot of places have dropped the cooperative. Um, in Connecticut, we do not get funding from the county level because we don't really have functioning county uh, governments anymore. So in Connecticut, it's um, federal dollars that come in and then there's state dollars as well. But that's still a cooperative. Uh, so we still like to keep the cooperative as part of our name. Then during the Great Depression, going back a little bit, um, the USDA was emphasizing uh, farm management for individual farmers and they were teaching farmers about how to market, um, how to work together as cooperatives so they could buy um, in greater volume together, they could sell together as a cooperative. And also that's when home economics was really kind of formed, um, helping a lot of people understand how to do canning so they could preserve a lot of their food on their farms. During World War II, this expanded and 4-H um, more 4-H club members uh, became involved in this thing, which was set up to really train the next generation of farmers working with the youth. Um, so that was, that's been a great partnership. Um, and of course that obviously continues to today because there are so many kids that even go to University of Connecticut um, that have been through 4-H programs in their counties. Um, and so today's partnership actually is a little different. It's been expanded. So our today, the partnership that we have is between federal agencies, which includes um, at USDA, we have the uh, NIFA, which is um, where we get a lot of our grants. It's a, then we have FSA, where a lot of farmers um, get money from, um, NRCS, Natural Resources. And then we have the Risk Management Agency, which handles uh, crop insurance. Along with that, we have the nutrition from the FNEP uh, program as well, which works with the low um, income uh, populations. So we have, we have this, the USDA and federal agencies working with land grant universities. We work with the private sector. We work with nonprofits and we work not only um, within our state, but we work regionally, we work nationally and then we work internationally as well. So many countries are, around the world also have extension services and Suresh can probably tell you what they have over in, in Nepal. So this is not something that is unique just to our country. So next slide. 
So talking about what I do, I'm the uh, fruit specialist. I'm also the IPM program coordinator for the university and I'm a faculty member um, in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture. Um, part of my job as a faculty member is I teach a small fruit production course in the spring semesters. It's a, I'm in a totally grant funded position, uh, which means I need to get grant money to support the position um, year round. So with extension, I do work with the commercial fruit industry which includes those who have been around, um, who are also outside of just growing, but we have the related industries. So you have irrigation companies, um, equipment companies, um, chemical companies, and so on. So all the related industries I also work with as part of the programming. So I work with folks who uh, have orchards, vineyards, and berry farms that have been around for generations, as well as those who are new and beginning, who have no experience or minimal experience when it comes to fruit growing. So for example, in 2018, with two other colleagues at, on campus um, and with members of the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, I wrote and received a grant to work with them to establish a food uh, farm on their property for food security. So uh, since then I've passed that on to Shresh and he now uh, runs that one. So we do a lot of grants working with different groups around the state. Um, we do multi-state grants where we can help um, uh, we do a lot of work uh, regionally as well. So I also work with farms that are several hundred acres down to those that are less than an acre. So I kind of really run the gamut. I work with those who are organic, those who are not organic, um, those who aren't really sure what they want to do. Maybe they want to be in between. Um, a lot of farms would have cutting edge technology such as they do the high uh, density plantings where the trees are two to three feet apart. They use computer technology to pinpoint areas in the field that need fertilizer. They're using platforms for a lot of working on these trees because even when we're planting them two to three feet apart, they can be very tall. And then we have some that have the latest technology, um, computerized packing houses. Uh, so, I, so I really run the gamut of anybody who's interested in fruit. It doesn't matter your um, level of knowledge or your level of experience. So I also, one thing I do is we get people to call that are interested in either purchasing land or they bought land and have decided they want to get into fruit growing. Um, so I'll walk the property with them and we'll look at it, kind of look at the layout, what's, where's the best place for, for fruit if they want it on there. Uh, we talk about the soil sampling, how to do that, what they need to do um, and getting their organic matter level um, as well. So I always recommend when I do a soil sample, at least the first time also do organic. Um, and Dawn can get more into that one, but I know it's like $7 for organic and I tell them it's well worth it because that impacts your nitrogen fertilizing when you do that. Um, I work, I do conduct research and I do them on farms. I don't do it at the agricultural station um, at stores. It's nice to be out on farms working with growers. Um, they really wanna be involved in it, which is a lot of fun too. So my main focus is on plant nutrition uh, and soil health, um, primarily looking at uh, soil nutritional analysis, uh, tissue analysis, and we combine that with the crop load, uh, the environmental factors for that year, and come up with a fine-tuned fertilizer program. Another big focus, because we've had so many problems lately, is with invasive pests. We had spotted ring drosophila that arrived on the scene in the late summer, early fall of 2011. Then brown marmorated stink bug showed up. Uh, we've been dealing with that one. Um, and the nice thing about dealing with these pests is we work together regionally and with the stink bug, it's been nationally and same way with the spotted ring drosophila. So we come up with management strategies, get that information out to growers. And now it's just like we just move right along. So it doesn't really kill us on what we're doing. Um, then now we have the spotted lanternfly, which is in our state. And that one's gonna be a real problem primarily with uh, grapes and with apple trees among other ornamentals. Um, the nice thing about spotted lanternfly, if there is one nice thing is it doesn't eat the fruit, it doesn't lay eggs in the fruit, but it can kill the vines, can kill the trees just by um, feeding on the actual plant itself. So in addition, I run uh, demonstrations, uh, workshops um, during the season, as well as in the winter where we can have some hands-on stuff during the summer outside, twilight meetings we conduct um, on the farms and that, those I do in conjunction with the Connecticut Pomological Society, which is a great group of growers. Um, having these things done out on the farms is nice because you can see real world situations. Um, at the research farm, there is a need for a lot of work done there, 
but I like to do it out um, with the growers for that. I've done workshops on pruning, small fruit, tree fruit. Um, I've done scouting uh, workshops where we learn how to uh, scout for insects and diseases, the timing and everything for berries. I've done it also with uh, tree fruit. We look for beneficials, talking about thresholds, the, uh, the economic threshold, because as you know, in ag, we don't care about the aesthetic threshold. We're more concerned with the economic threshold. And we talk about management options um, and so on. I do send out um, e-newsletters. So if you want to get into fruit and you're not on my newsletter list, let me know and I can get you on that one. Um, I, these come out periodically during the winter and the off season. They, I do more than one a week generally during the growing season, particularly if something all of a sudden comes up. I do work um, across state lines. I do work with uh, other extension and research folks in New England um, at Cornell, New Jersey at Rutgers, uh, Penn State University, uh, Maryland, and also at the USDA, um, Beltsville and Winchester Farms. So we do a lot of work together and we also set up program together. The other thing too is, is I, you know, you can, I can consult with you on the phone. Uh, we can do email and pre-COVID, we did a lot of face-to-face. -face, so hopefully when everyone gets vaccinated this year, we can get back to a little bit more of the face-to-face -face, um, meetings on, on the farms. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we can also do a Zoom meeting. I've done Zoom meetings with some growers one-on-one -on -one, uh, because sometimes it's easier and, and nicer just to look at each other and chat than it is to do it on phone or on email. So that's just in a kind of a nutshell what I do with my fruit programming. Um, but again, if you're not on the newsletter list and you do want to receive um, my fruit newsletters, uh, just get a hold of me and let me know. Okay, before we jump into Shresh's portion, does anybody have any questions for Mary about her role? I actually have a question. Wait, okay. sorry, go ahead. You go. <laughs> okay, um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, do you have the capacity to, to do this type of farm walk and assessment with anybody who wants it? Or do you sort of like have to um, limit yourself to a certain type of grower or farmer to do that type of support? No, anybody who wants to get into the business commercially, I will do it with. I don't care what size. Um, because, it, it, I mean, you want to grow, say you want to grow strawberries and you're going to start off with a half an acre. Well, that's still a lot of strawberries. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't matter. I don't do it with homeowners. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the time um, to do that. And I, I really limit myself to commercial. But that doesn't mean you have to be commercial for me to work with you right off the bat because you may not be there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something you're contemplating, um, but you want to know more about whether it would work on your property or you just want to have you just want to get more information on what would be needed, um, where to get the plants, how to start off. Um, when I meet with folks who are just getting started, I go through a lot of questions with them. Um, first off is, you know, how, what's, your, what's your background in this? Because I don't want to talk down to them, mm -hmm. but I want their level. And then it's like, um, how do you want to market it? Um, what are your plans on whether you're going to be organic or not organic? Because that will, that will impact when we start talking about different varieties because you want to do organic and you want to do tree fruit or apples, then it's like, well, then you really want to stick to disease resistant. Mm -hmm. so there's a whole slew of questions I asked somebody, um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one person that I never heard from again, um, who contacted me because they had been growing uh, raspberries in their garden and thought this was great and had bought a 45 acre piece of property and decided they would just kind of grow a huge volume of raspberries. I don't know if they're gonna plant all 45 acres, but they were talking about many, many acres. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to go from a small 10 foot strip in a garden to many acres. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my questions there were, how are you going to market it? And the answer was, I don't know. Um, if you're going to do, are, are you going to have labor? I don't know. Well, who's going to do the pruning? I don't know. Um, and it, then I said, well, how are you going to manage spotted ring Drosophila? And they're like, well, what is that? So I knew we had a huge education ahead of us on that one. And I said, well, once you decide what you want to do, and I gave him a lot of information and resources to look up. And I said, you know, once you kind of figure out this is what you want to do, let me know. We'll, we'll talk some more and we can look at the land. And I never heard from him again. Hmm. Um, I, think, I think he found out that was a little overwhelming. Um, so one goal I have when I talk to folks who are just wanting to get into it is I don't want you to 
lose all your retirement income um, on this. So I want to be honest with you about what it's going to cost uh, so that when you, if you decide to go into it, you're going in with your eyes open. Because mm -hmm. folks, I'll say a lot. There, there are folks that get into it thinking there's a romance to farming um, and there is, but you need to have that romance with your eyes wide open as well. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe your wallet closed for a while. <laughs> you really know what you're going to get into. So, yeah. it's, a snowball. It, it's not like you're going to plant them and walk away and watch them grow, which some folks think. So, although I'm sure nobody on this thinks that. Nobody <laughs> thinks me. Any other questions? MC just asked the question that I was going to ask. Oh. So, um, I'm very excited by your presentation. I am just starting out. I'm doing a lot of research. I've read a ton, um, putting business plan together. Um, and um, really where I'm lacking the expertise is, well, in various areas, but, um, you know, the farm layout, uh, it's a small, small piece of land and um, we have access to uh, additional acres, but I want to start small. Um, so, um, can I send you an email after the, after the presentation? Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. We can talk. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I like your idea of starting small because, you know, yeah. you don't necessarily know how much labor is, is involved in how much time commitment you have. So if you start small and you master it and you only have the market, then yeah. you can, and it makes it much easier and much smoother. Right. I love fruit. Very excited. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions before we hand it over to Shresh? We can also pause at the very end if you wanna wait for everyone's presentations. All right, take it away. Thanks MC uh, for doing this uh, in the first place. Uh, this is exciting. I think this is win-win. I get to know some of you uh, and you get to know the programs that UConn does for uh, growers. My name is Suresh Gamire and I am Assistant Extension Educator and Vegetable Specialist at UConn Extension. I'm based out of uh, Tallinn County Extension Center, but I work with growers statewide. Um, there is only one Vegetable Extension Specialist to work with growers. Uh, well, there are other resources, other people for um, greenhouse growers, which I will provide uh, the a link to. Um, later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll give a brief background. Um, I did my PhD at Washington State University in Washington. Um, I worked on biodegradable plastic molds for um, vegetable production, focusing on fruit, uh, sorry, crop yield and quality. We just came from fruits so, and molds uh, biodegradation in soil over time. And I did my master's from Nepal and I worked on organic manures uh, for sweet paper production uh, in the mid hills. And I also did my bachelor's degree from Nepal. Uh, next, please. Now I'll talk about the objectives and goal of my vegetable extension program at UConn. And the program intend to assist um, commercial growers, vegetable growers with diagnosis and management of vegetable pests, insects, disease, weeds, and other issues. Um, publish new information about vegetable pests and other critical issues. And I'll give some examples in later slides. And as Mary, I also collaborate with other organizations, university to conduct uh, vegetable production, pest management, nutrient management, research and extension activities in Connecticut and New England and, and beyond. Overall goal of the program is to serve the state vegetable industry and I mainly work with field and high tunnel vegetables. Next, please. Uh, these are the main educational outreach opportunities for growers. Um, beginners or um, experienced growers. Um, I'll expand on some of these later on. Um, I, I do consultations with um, commercial vegetable growers. Um, 
is maybe mentioned through emails, phone calls, Zooms, FaceTime, whatever works for growers and myself. Um, offer on, on farm vegetable IPM training season long. That did not happen last year, and we'll see how it goes this year. Uh, this is um, under this program, I, I could come to your farm once a week or every other week, um, depending on our schedules. And um, you and I could walk um, through the field and see what's going on, what are the insect pest diseases that are um, there and talk about management strategies and things like that. And I also do farm visit on need basis. You can call me, email me, and if there is an issue, um, and if my visit could be a help, then I'd be happy to come um, and visit the farm. And um, if needed, take a sample, bring it to the diagnostic lab um, and provide the results later on. Uh, I produced a, week, a weekly vegetable pest alert during the fill uh, vegetable growing season, mainly from May to September. Uh, I'll expand a little bit on that. I work with Mary um, in producing Crop Talk, which is a quarterly newsletter. Um, I also work with a regional vegetable specialist in updating New England Vegetable Management Guide, which is a great resource for beginner farmers uh, to um, experience large scale growers, which is available online and also a hard copy for purses. And Mary and I both work on this um, committee to organize New England Vestal and Food Conference, which is every other year. And this year is going to be virtual. And um, we, again, I work with Mary Conklin. Um, to conduct annual Connecticut Vegetable and Spurl Fruit Growers Conference, and that did not happen last year. Instead, uh, we did a series of um, virtual events uh, through Zooms. Um, and there is uh, also a vegetable production certificate course that uh, I work with a team of extension uh, specialists and others at UConn which could be a great resource for beginner farmers. This is designed for beginner farmers. I'll talk more about this vegetable course and I also publish fact sheets and articles in varieties of form. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, in doing all of this, the uh, impasses would be on healthy soil, a balanced plant nutrition, proper pest and beneficial identification, scouting and monitoring techniques, preventative management strategies, and reduced risk, uh, use of reduced risk pesticides and um, resistance management. So all, all of these will be um, the guiding principles uh, in everything I, I intend to do. Uh, next slides, please. Um, so I'll expand a little bit on weekly vegetable pest messes. Um, we produced, um, I produced this pest message in Spanish language last year. Um, that was the first year um, that was produced in Spanish language. And I'll see um, if there is interest um, for Spanish version this year as well. So I produce weekly pest alert based on my scouting. Uh, at farms based on the field reports um, from growers um, and also from inputs from uh, regional vegetable specialist or, uh, ne from neighboring state. So what, what weekly pest alert does is it urges uh, you to be on the lookout for specific pest uh, diseases that are, um, that are coming, that are potentially coming to your farm based on observation from your neighbor's farm in this state or um, in the neighboring state. And there are several diseases and insects that move from south and we, we will know if they are coming closer to you. And these weekly vegetable pests a lot can be uh, really helpful um, to be, to prepare yourself for the, potentially upcoming pest. And um, I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll also provide um, a link uh, to 
um, a web page where you can subscribe to not only Visitable Pest Lover, but also Mary's newsletter and some other resources um, as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a um, crop talk newsletter that um, I work with Mary Conklin to produce. Uh, the goal is to provide information on the latest developments um, and also in, inform growers about upcoming educational events and opportunities. The next one is coming soon. Um, again, um, you can you can subscribe to you can be on the email list by either emailing me or. Um, or um, Mary for, for this crop talk newsletter. Next slide, please. Um, this is a great resource. I use it a lot. And um, this um, this is a kind of Bible or Quran uh, for, for growers. Um, and it is intended to assist um, commercial growers. It, it talks about production technique for all major vegetable crops that can be grown in, that are grown in New England. It also lists nearly all pesticides that are listed and labeled um, for use in New England states. Um, talks about uh, cultural practices and cover crops, soil fertility, nutrient management, etc. So this is a huge source and it is online free, um, online version is free and the print copy uh, cost $25. Um, this guide plus another um, pest ID guide which has great pictures of a major pest in our region. Uh, next slide please. So I'll now talk about the this vegetable production course that was um, designed for beginner farmers who don't have a lot of experience, who has um, zero to three years of experience in growing crops or formal training or no formal training in agriculture. This was first launched um, on March 5th of 2020. Um, and then it was relaunched again in January of 2021. First, it was it started as a hybrid course um, two components online and uh, hands-on, but due to COVID, we changed it to all online. It has seven online modules, um, which contain self-paced video. You can watch them at your own time. And it has also supplementary materials and short quiz in each module. There is pre-test and post-test as well. And there were 23 and 23 in enrollments uh, in round one and round two. Uh, next slide, please. So I worked with um, um, lots of experts uh, from Yukon Extension, uh, from um, Growers Pool, and from um, Kip is a consultant, um, some of you may know. So I utilize the expertise of um, many of us in the team um, to design and um, prepare the course module. Uh, for example, Steve Mono, Mono um, some of you may know him, um, is a is a uh, trainer as well as a vegetable um, grower, and he taught the season extension module. Uh, next slide, please. So among the course participants, and in the first round, we had gardener, mostly gardeners, some current and prospective farmers, job seekers, and um, others. In others, there were two high school teachers and one microgreen producers. Next slide, please. So I also had a uh, post-course evaluation survey at the end of the course, uh, where participants indicated their changes in knowledge. Uh, this blue bar is their knowledge before the course, and the orange bar is knowledge after the course. And you can see the significant increase in their knowledge as reported by themselves. And there were seven modules, um, as you can see, business planning, site selection, warm season, vegetable crops, cool season, plant diagnostics, season extension, and marketing. Um, as Mary explained, uh, my program also works with farmers, other organizations, university to conduct on-farm trials. I also like to do trials on-farm as opposed to at a research uh, 
station, um, experiment station. And these photos are from a 2020 on-farm trial where we tested a new fertilizer product that had boron and SOP. Um, that is not in the market yet. So um, it does not, I don't have a name yet uh, for broccoli and tomato production. And what we saw was this, um, the last bar you see broxy is the yield of broccoli uh, in control treatment that is control is the growers standard versus um, all of others other treatments at varying rate you can see the difference in yield yield was higher for all the other treatments compared to the um, compared to this growers standard again this is not yet released so we don't have um, i don't have much to offer at this point but just wanted to share that we i do this kind of research and and the next slide, please. The other crop tested was tomato. Um, as you see, there was not much uh, difference um, among the treatments for the tomato in terms of tomato yield uh, per plot. Uh, next slide, please. I also, this is another example of um, regional co uh, collaboration. So I work with URI in uh, this uh, new um, New England High Tunnel Research Project. So if this is a multi-state, um, the um, research is happening in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. And we are looking at the nutrient movement in soil vertically and laterally. Um, we don't have much results yet. It started last year. Next slide, please. Um, so another example of um, beyond new england reason collaboration so i expanded upon my graduate work on soil biodegradable plastic molds now looking into molds biodegradation in soil after many years like up to six years after first incorporation and we produced uh, next slides please uh, we produced the results um, in different forms um, including journal articles newsletter articles um, facts it's extra this is one example where i um, i led a paper where we developed a sampling protocol to quantify the mic macro and microplastic in soil uh, for the first time um, and i would like to give you a brief um, results of of this work that is currently happening next slide please so here um this y-axis is percent of molds recovery, um, biodegradable plastic molds, and this is the timeline. So we started applying in 2015 fall, and then we applied uh, subsequently annually for four years until 2018, and then did not apply further, but we are tracking down the molds, uh, molds, presence of molds in the field. And you can see the recovery is going down and on an average about 10 or 12 percent is recovering after two years of uh, final molds incorporation. So that means molds are degrading um, in the field. So um, next slides, please. I would also like to bring your attention to a great resource we have at the Plant Diagnostic Lab. Uh, we I worked with um, Plant Diagnostic Lab in writing a grant proposal where um, we could um, establish, uh, we could actually start a, a new service, hot water treatment service from last year. Uh, we only had one sample last year, and um, hopefully we'll have more uh, samples um, this year. There was no service uh, at UConn on this hot water treatment uh, before. So um, I, I encourage you to check th this service out as well. And the last slide, please. So I would like to leave you with a lots of resources and some of you may be already familiar with a lot of these. Uh, new Farmer Bucket List, a great resource for new farmers. Um, so I work with the field and high tunnel vegetables and there are specialists who work on greenhouse vegetables as well. Um, again, plant diagnostic lab, we'll hear from Dawn Soil Lab and Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station and all these um, agencies for um, grant opportunities. Um, 
And this is a link where you can sign up for different newsletters from new Yukon Extension. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I learned so much, I feel like, in <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, and I'll make sure to send out the slides to everyone after this. Um, so don't worry too much about trying to copy them all down right now. Um, I can definitely email out all of these oh, links. Um, so while we are talking, I forgot, I have another slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, to <laughs> my wonderful uh, person Mackenzie White who is the program assistant in uh, our office um, and thanks to all the funding agencies that enable me to work on all these projects. That's all. If you have any questions I'll be happy to answer. And forgive uh, my voice because I have a common cold and congested nose. So hopefully you heard some of what I spoke. <laughs> uh, my best contact information now is uh, my email address, which I'll type um, here as well. Um, reading from chat box and uh, I do lots of phone conversation, even even though I'm too far away. And after a short uh, phone call, I usually set up a Zoom or or a WebEx meeting um, because that's easier, cheaper, and more um, effective. So the first, um, the best best way to reach me is email. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rush. Um, if there's no other questions, we will move on to hearing from Don from the Soil Lab. Take it away. Hey, well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, I, I I've been working at the I've been running the Soil Lab for the last almost 23 years. It will be next month, and um, I don't do research. I do other people's research samples. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what the soil testing lab has to offer. Um, I also do extension work, but my extension work is primarily geared to um, homeowners, master gardeners, master composters, um, not necessarily commercial growers, although um, anytime I'm asked to you know, um, participate in, in a commercial grower session like this, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about soil testing today. So next slide. So, you know, why bother soil testing? I mean, think about it three different ways. One, you're, you're gonna be optimizing the pH and nutrients your plants need. If your plants have um, what they need, and, you know, also as far as, you know, sunlight and temperature and stuff like that, you're gonna get good production. But we can tell you what your pH and nutrients are and if you have to add anything. Um, there's no point in wasting money on adding fertilizer, whether organic or non-organic, if you don't need to. So from an economic standpoint, it makes sense. And also, you know, phosphorus and nitrogen are two really large um, pollutants of our fresh and, and salt water. And so we really, you know, if you, if you soil test, we can tell you what your different values are. And we're hoping that this will help you minimize any kind of environmental impacts. All right, next, next slide. So I, when I tell, talk to people about soil testing, I say, think of it as a tool and, and kind of like think about soil testing as, you know, when you're gonna go to the grocery store, what do you do? You usually see what's available to you before you go shopping. And that way, you know that you're not gonna end up buying stuff that you already have in your cabinet. And soil testing sort of the same thing. It tells you what's in your soil now, what's available to your plants. And if you know that, then we recommend, and then you can decide what, what you want to um, purchase. And it's important to know if you have too much of something or too little of something. Next slide. So really, um, I, I guess this, all right, maybe press it one more time. There you go. Sorry, some of these, I, I, I do them myself and I'm so used to them. I forgot to, to take off some of the, I don't think too many of the other ones have all those little automated things in there, but 
your, your results are only as good as your sample. So we really stress that people put a little bit of effort into taking their sample. You know, we get these people that send in these tiny little spoonfuls of soil and we joke you know, at the lab saying, oh, this person must want a micronutrient analysis because they just sent us a micro soil sample. But, you know, you really want to take several, maybe a, a dozen or so samples, subsamples, you mix them all together in a clean container. And again, the landscapers that come in with their used coffee cups are not something that you particularly appreciate. Um, and then we only need for a standard nutrient test, we only need one cup of soil. So that's not a lot when you kind of think of it. It's a very small amount that you're sending in, which is why it's so important for you to take a, a good sample. So next slide. So for instance, for each acre, you might want to do like a dozen different um, you know, subsamples. The subsamples don't need to be large. Again, collect them, put them in a clean container, mix them up and pull out one cup of soil for soil testing. So I just wanted to stress the importance. It really is, it, it's, this is where we, and we get questions from whether it's a homeowner or whether it's a commercial grower or an agronomic grower, you know, they'll send in a soil sample one year um, and then we'll tell them to do something and they'll submit a sample the next year and they'll find either A, it's changed a real lot or B, it hasn't changed at all. And most likely the reason is if they did follow our recommendations is just was that their sampling techniques were not that good and they just really didn't do a very good representative sample. So you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money by, by not um, following you know, our advice to take a, a good sample. All right, next slide. So how many samples do you need? It really depends. It's, it's hard for me to just tell you you need X number of samples. We, we basically tell people that um, if they've been treating, the, if the soil hasn't been treated at all or it's been treated the same, you probably could put up to 15 acres in one sample if you're doing this for the first time to get an overall representation. But, but what, to break it down a little bit more, what we tell people is that if your soils look different, you know, they physically look different, or let's say they're different parts of the landscape. So you have some that are way high up on the hill, you have some that are in the lower part and the drainage is poor. Those areas you want to sample separately. Obviously, if you put different amounts of limestone or fertilizer or manure or compost or whatever on different areas of, of the property, you'd want to sample those separately. And then sometimes we tell people, we've, we've had instances where people have a, a field and we have one, one guy who had a, um, was bringing in samples to the plant diagnostic lab of striped corn. He had sweet corn that had really uh, distinguishing white stripes going down it. So we suspected maybe it was a micronutrient um, issue and, and their, their yard sloped down. It was a wet year. It was a little bit wet in this area. So they sent in a soil sample for the area where the plants were experiencing some kind of distress. And then they sent in the samples of the um, rest of the the field to see, to see if they could do a comparison. So sometimes they might want to do that as well. Um, so that those would be reasons why you would you would send in more than one sample. All right, next slide. So what do we do? Um, so our, you know we're, we're we're a small lab. There's only, there's only myself and my technician, and and we have a part time morning person. And then when we don't have COVID, we have students. So. We, can, we really can only offer a, a handful of analysis. We'd rather just offer things that we can do well as opposed to you know, dig our grave too deep and not be able to follow through with some of the um, analysis that people are interested in. There are other labs that are better staffed um, that are university labs that can do more tests. But what we do if with a standard nutrient analysis, which, which by the way, right now costs $12 a sample, um, we, we run the soil pH, and then we need to make a limestone recommendation. So we run a chemical buffer pH so we can give you the limestone requirement. Um, we, we use an extractant called the modified Morgan extractant. And that was developed by Dr. Morgan at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station in New Haven. He called it the um, universal soil extracting solution. So what we're doing when we measure the nutrients in your soils is we are not measuring the total amounts of nutrients. We don't care what the total amounts of nutrients in, and your plants don't really care about the total amounts of nutrient in the soil. What they care about is say, not how much total phosphorus is in the soil, but how much is available for their growth this year. And what you need to know as a farmer is do you have to add any more phosphorus to get a good harvest? 
you know, good, good production. So we don't measure total nutrients, we measure extractable nutrients. And we do phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and, and um, magnesium. And then um, we're able to also, um, we have a, a piece of equipment, an ICP, and we're able to run, um, I think we run like 12 or 14 elements all at one time. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's simultaneous, which is really nice. So we can just tell it what wavelengths to measure. So we're able to do a bunch of micros and sulfur as well. And um, we don't have actually recommendations for the micronutrients. What we do give you is we give you what your micronutrient values are as far as extractable. And then we give you a, a, a typical soil range. And it's mostly for you to use as a diagnostic tool. Um, since we do have, have an ICP and we run a chemical buffer, we're able to tell you what the estimated cation exchange capacity is in your soil. And that's a measurement of the soil's ability to hold and retain nutrients. And so if it's around 10 or higher, you're, you're doing pretty good and the soil should be able to hold the nutrients that your plants need. Um, we also offer a calculation for base saturation and we do have a few organic vegetable growers that um, really feel this is the way they wanna manage their nutrients depending upon how much calcium, magnesium and, and potassium is in the soil. We don't make recommendations, but we offer them that, that value. Um, for, for homeowners, for, for farmers, I don't think you're going to find too much lead in your soil unless you're redoing the site of an old apple orchard because they used to use lead arsenate as a pesticide. But for homeowners, there's a lot of people. Connecticut's an old state with a lot of old painted buildings with a lot of old roads. And we find about 20% of our soil samples actually have, have elevated lead levels. And since we can run it for free, we don't have to pay extra. We can just run it at the same time. Um, we feel that we, we're doing a service to the community to let people know what their lead levels are. And if they're elevated, we, we give people interpretation for that. So all of those are included in the standard nutrient analysis. Um, and as long as you tell us what you're growing, we'll make recommendations. And our, actually our recommendations come from the book that Shuris had recommended, the New England Vegetable Growers Management Guide. That's where we get our vegetable recommendations from. Um, we also offer if people want for an additional fee because there is a different test. The soils have to be prepared differently. We have to do different things to them. Uh, we have different pieces of equipment to do these things. We can tell you what the percent organic matter is. And as Mary was saying, that's really an important determinant of many things in your soil, including your soil health, the ability to hold nutrients, um, what, how, how well it can support um, you know, soil microbes, things like that. Um, we don't really give recommendations for organic matter. We just tell people if it's somewhere between four and 8%, you're probably doing pretty, pretty decent for most crops. Um, soluble salts are sometimes of interest, especially if you're um, adding a lot of compost or manures to your soils. Um, that's an extra test and we'll tell you what that is. And we give you an interpretation whether the soil's saline or mildly saline or, or if, if it's greater than four, you're gonna have issues. Um, if you want, we can tell people what the amount of sand, silt, and clay is. I mean, a lot of people can actually do a hand, quick hand texture. We just use a um, hydrometer and tell you percent sand, silt, and clay total. And then um, I think this little guy got moved over a little bit in this slide. We, we offer a, what's called the PSNT, the pre-sidrostyl nitrate test. We do not give you nitrogen in our regular soil test because it fluctuates so widely in the environment that at best would be giving you a snapshot of how much nitrogen you have in your soil today. And at worst, we could be giving you a false number. So we, we make the recommendations um, as a general rule of thumb based on um, research, which was done in the research farm or in other universities in the Northeast with the former agronomist that used to work here. And they figured out, for instance, you know, sweet corn needs about hundred pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. And so they know that for the different crops, it's, it's in the New England vegetable guide. So that's what we use for our nitrogen recommendation. However, if you're a, a um, somebody who's been using copious amounts of manures or compost, something that's gonna slowly release nitrogen to the soil, you might be interested in, a, or, or just organic fertilizers, and it's been a cold, wet spring, for instance, you might be interested in the PSNT. We usually run it from June 1st to like the end of August, and um, the sampling's done slightly different. You can look on our website or call me um, if you're interested in that. 
And we do a 24 hour turnover. We tell you how much nitrate nitrogen is available. If it's less than 25, you probably have to add some more. If it's over 25, then it's sufficient. And sometimes in a cold, wet spring, if you're using organic fertilizers or manures or lots of compost, you might not get the availability because you might not be getting the microbial decomposition in the soil. So even if there's nitrogen in your amendments that you've been adding, it might not be available to your plants and you may need to use it. Um, primarily, we offer it to mostly silage corn growers, sweet corn growers, and pumpkin growers. Those are what we've, there's been research done, so we know what kind of recommendations to make for that. All right, next slide. Oh, click, click, click. So what do we end up doing? Just real quickly, whoops, go back one more. So we, we get your soils, we dry them on little pieces of paper, we sieve them, we add some extracting solution to a, a flask, we shake it, we put it on, um, we, we after we shake it, we pour it through into these filter papers, into test tubes, and then we run it on our ICP. So there's a lot of steps involved. And, and so we had, you know, one, one kind of funny story is, Somebody came in a few years ago, it was a homeowner, brought us a soil sample. And this is when we were letting people in. And so we, you know, we got the person filled out the form, we took the money, we took the sample, and then the person sat down. And I said, is there something else I, I can help you with? And he goes, well, I'm waiting for results. And I said, well, you're probably gonna have to wait a week. <laughs> yes, it, it's the, the very fastest we could do things is three days in the lab. We typically tell people seven to 10 days just to be on the safe side. In April, we are just, we can only run a hundred samples a day. And some days we're getting in two or 300 soil samples. So the earlier you get your samples in the best, um, fall is actually a really good time to soil test because it's really, you get your results back quicker and you'll be all set for spring. And if you have to add limestone, you can do that because you know it takes six to 12 months for it to start working anyways. But anyways, it's a multi-stage process. It's not something that we could do like that. I wish we could just take your soil and pour it in a little machine and get the results, but we can't. So what do our results look like? So next slide. So basically, I, I know it's kind of hard to read, um, but what we end up doing is, again, I just wanted to remind you, we're doing extractable, not total nutrients. We have, we have um, in the, about the middle of the page, these little bars, and we have categories, below optimum, optimum, above optimum, and we only have excessive for phosphorus. We know what that is, but we don't know what it is for other elements. Um, your, your goal is to get all your nutrients in the, um, optimum category. And then underneath you'll see we have the soil pH, we have the buffer pH, we have the estimated cation exchange capacity. I, I know you probably can't see all these things from here, but at any rate, and then to the right we have your, your um, um, micronutrients. And then we have, what we did is we took a thousand soil samples, we did micronutrients, and we just came up with a typical range. We just kind of averaged them out. We're not, we're not, we don't have any recommendations to make except for for boron, I know is um, there's certain crops that are deficient in boron. And, and I think Mary would make a recommendation for boron if it was low, maybe for apples in the, in the tissue, which I'll talk about in a second. And I think there's a couple other crops, but uh, um, alfalfa, we recommend people putting boron on every few years because our soils are typically deficient in boron, but there really isn't for any of the other micronutrients. There's no field studies that give you recommendations that say if you're modified Morgan Copper is X adds so much. We just tell people if the pH and your, is where it's supposed to be and the organic matter is supposed to be, um, usually you should have enough micronutrients, especially if you're using organic fertilizers. And then you can see down a little bit below there where I have limestone and fertilizer recommendations. I just picked mixed vegetables. But for growers, we tell people pounds of N, P, and K per acre, as opposed to if you were a homeowner, we'd tell you to use like so much 5, 10, 10 per thousand square feet or something along those lines. And then for if you're a vegetable grower, we give you Shurish's contact information. If you're a fruit grower, we give you Mary's contact information. And then we give you some basic interpretation sheets. We have a general interpretation sheet. Um, and then sometimes if there's other ones that we think would be um, good for you to read, we, we put those on too. So that's what, we, that's what the test consists of. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention tissue testing briefly. So the next slide. All right, so, you know, um, we, we, act, we actually, although Mary would like us to tissue test a lot more, it's even a little bit more cumbersome than doing soil testing. So it's not something that we go out and we pass out flyers and say, everybody do tissue testing. It's a very valuable tool, it really is. Um, it's just that it, it's, it's with, with such a small lab, it's hard for us to do high volume. So we tell people 
send in your tissue gladly. It's not a problem, but it might take a little bit longer to get the results because we have to do several steps with this too. But it's really good to monitor, you know, the nutritional status of perennial crops. So if you're growing strawberries, you're growing apple trees, and I know actually Avril Farms, or is it Avril Farms, you guys send in tissue samples every, every year or every few years. Um, I remember that because I'm the one who does all the tissue testing. Um, we also get have some organic farmers that often bring me in curious crops because they've added this and they've added that and they're not quite sure why their plants are looking the way they do. And so you can use tissue testing to identify you know, nutrient deficiencies or imbalances. Um, and the thing is, it, it's the reason why tissue testing sometimes is more important than soil testing is just because the nutrients in the soil does not mean that the plant can take it up. There's a lot of things that affect plant take up. I mean, most of you probably are familiar with, you know, you see blossom end rot on a tomato and it's because there could be calcium in the soil, there couldn't be calcium in the soil, but even if there's all the calcium in the world in the soil, if there's no water to take it up, the plants can't actually get the calcium that they need. So the plants get the blossom end rot. So this is a really good way to, to you know, see if, if you can't figure out why your plants are doing, are exhibiting these symptoms and you had a soil test and the soil test looks all right, you know, have, by all means have a tissue test done. Um, so what would you need for a tissue test? Can you go to the next slide? I only have a couple more slides. So it's hard for me to tell you exactly what for you to send in, except you need more than one leaf. Um, it, it really depends on the plant. So some plants like for, for, depending on the stage of growth, sometimes we tell you to send in petioles. Sometimes we tell you to send in the whole leaf. Sometimes if it's grass or, or grasses, we would tell you to send in clippings. So I do have some really, um, some of the more common fruit and vegetable crops. I put up instructions of what we would need and how many, like for instance, if you're doing blueberries, blueberry leaves are kind of small. I, I want you to send me in 50 blueberry leaves and also, um, I have a book of standards and these standards um, say, give me interpretation, but just if you send in the, um, the sample according to the direction. So if, if it says, you know, 50 blueberry leaves following bloom, and then you send in tissue samples in September, I may not be able to, uh, I'll give you the results, but I'm, I may not have in my that book of standards and, and um, any kind of correlation. So there's, they, there's, there's survey standards and there's sufficiency standards depending upon the crop. You know, I, anytime I find standards for tissues, I just keep printing them off and sticking them in my book there. So I have the results for lots and lots of different you know, uh, plant samples, but not for everything. So it's important that you send in the right plant part at the right time of year if you want something to um, compare it to. And again, it's gonna probably take about two weeks. Sometimes it's quicker this week. I, I'm actually running tissues in like three days because I have other stuff that needs to do those same processes. Right now we're charging $20 per sample. Um, and that includes um, everything, including nitrogen. If you don't need nitrogen, cause you suspect that you need have some sort of a, like in this case, I think Leanne suspected it was some sort of manganese deficiency. It, it's $5 less cause the nitrogen is a separate test. So to show you the next slide, to show you what the tissue looks like. So you could see on the, in the, in these are the nutrients that we test for. And, and we also threw in some non-essential ones just because we run them on the ICP all the time. We'll tell you what your results are and we'll tell you what the survey range is. And then again, if it's a fruit, I'll send it to Mary. If it's a vegetable, I'll send it to Shurish and you could talk to them about making specific recommendations. There's just too many variables. I don't have any, I don't have any computerized recommendation. So we do the nitrogen, we, this, these are total. We, we, we acid digest your, your, we ash and acid digest your sample. And then we tell you what the percent is, the total percent on a dry weight basis for phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and, and sodium, and also the total percent nitrogen. And then we do parts per million of the rest. And then again, if you're in our, if the, your crop is in our reference book, I will, I will be able to make either survey or sufficiency range I'll be able to show you so you can use it as a comparison. So we do the best we can. Those are the two tests that we have to offer. And um, so that, that's it for me. So one more slide. So I'm just telling people, you know, you can't just run your, you can't just like, you know, smell your soil, taste your soil, look at your plants and always know what's wrong. So testing sometimes it's not that expensive. We try to make it worthwhile and 
if you have any questions about that at all, you know, feel free. It's, it's really easy, again, for, to reach out to me via email. I usually answer all my emails before I go to bed, but you're welcome to call the lab too. We're here and we'll answer the phone. So thank you. Anybody has any questions, that's fine. Hi, Dawn, thank you so much. Um, how often would you recommend getting the soil tested? At least annually or? No, we usually tell people every three to five years, okay. unless you have to make a major change. If you, if, if you are There's adding issues. a lot of lime, a lot of fertilizer, because the soil is very infertile, um, maybe what you want to do is mix in all your amendments and wait a year and then retest. And then after that, usually about every third year. Great, thank you. Anybody else? You guys can always email me too. Thanks so much, Don. Um, I love seeing the science side of agriculture. I feel like I know nothing about that, but it's so crucial um, and cool. Um, would you mind putting your email into the chat? Um, oh, sure. It's on, it's on the first slide too. Oh, type cool. it in. Sweet. Um, and then I'll pass it on to our last presenter from the Solid Ground Program, um, Charlotte. Charlotte, I think you're muted. I was muted. Thank you. <laughs> Talking to myself over here. I'm Charlotte Ross, and I was just saying it's so nice to see some colleagues from Extension. We haven't seen each other in so long. Um, and I have definitely had my soil tested by Dawn, and I've gotten advice from Shiresh and Mary, and I think they're all wonderful um, experts in their fields. Um, so I am here to uh, talk to you about Solid Ground, which is a farmer um, training program, education program. Um, and I, first of all, I'm a farmer. I'm a vegetable, uh, organic vegetable farmer in Lebanon, Connecticut at Sweet Acre Farm. Um, but I, in the winters and in the off season, I work with extension um, on the solid ground program. So we had, this is the second iteration of um, what is a grant funded program um, that I work on with this team of of wonderful women. Uh, Jeff Martin is our project director and she's an extension educator in the sustainable food system. Um, and I also uh, totally celebrate Mackenzie White with you, Shiresh. Uh, she's a wonderful program assistant to all of us at Extension and certainly the Solid Ground program. Um, I am a co-coordinator with Nancy Barrett. So um, we have the same position. It's um, gotten, it's a pretty big program. So that's nice to have two of us. And Becca Toms does communication for lots of um, the programs that Jeff works on as well as ours. And she does beautiful flyers and marketing and things. Um, so as I was saying, we had a previous iteration, Solid Ground 1 um, was, uh, sorry, I'm wondering if I'm on the right slides or not, sorry. <laughs> Let's go to the second slide, please. Um, so this is, the, the Solid Ground 1 was um, a series of courses uh, in lots of different topics of farming from farm finance to how to grow vegetables to and fruit, um, soil analysis, lots of good stuff. And in this second iteration, um, which is a grant funded program that is funded through the beginning farmer and rancher development monies through the USDA, um, we branched out into a lot of different areas that you'll see here. Um, which is why it's great to have a co-coordinator. And we, it also allowed us to partner with a lot of wonderful organizations um, that work in ag, like the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance, um, as well as CT NOFA and others that you'll see throughout the, the program. So this is the list here, but I'm gonna go into each of them. So we'll just keep moving. Um, we can go into the next slide. Thanks. Um, so, one of the things we offer is the ag mechanic trainings. At the moment, it's the only thing that is in person. Um, and we offer those in partnership with two ag science high schools. Um, Nanawag is in 
Woodbury and Rockville is in Rockville. Um, and these facilities are, we realized in Solid Ground One, we had a couple of these ag mechanic trainings that uh, turned out to be very popular because farmers just tend to need to know at least a little bit about a ton of different things, right? So these hands-on trainings are um, pretty invaluable, I would say myself as a farmer um, to get a, a basic knowledge of welding, to learn how to use a chainsaw safely, um, to how to take care of your, your small engines like mowers and blowers and all sorts of little things on the farm, little tools. We've done um, an, uh, tractor maintenance before and and may be able to do that in a in a upcoming year, um, electrical and power tools and carpentry we do a little bit of all of those things on our farms so it's wonderful to have the opportunity to put our hands on those tools and learn from experts. Um, the next slide. Uh, the agroecology series, my colleague Nancy runs this one, um, and this year we were able to offer. Um, and also our, we've offered the no-till growing already with Andrew Mefford. Um, this is their virtual presentations. Um, so the first two uh, that you see here are Zoom um, presentations uh, that will actually be posted on our website after the fact as well. So if you can't make them on the actual dates, you'll be able to see them. Um, and we'll be doing one at High Hill Orchard in Meriden, it, actually in person coming up in March. Um, and this is kind of a small O organic growing techniques uh, series. So how to do things, we find that beginner farmers um, have a tendency to be, to skew towards the organic. Um, I'm a certified organic grower, but we don't, you don't have to be, nobody has to be. And, um, but you can still kind of, you know, we don't have to choose sides of conventional versus organic. There's lots of gray area in there and there's lots of wonderful techniques um, that growers and professionals um, can teach us. So we've also in the solid ground arena tried to lean on not just extension experts and industry experts, but also farmers ourselves to, um, to share knowledge on what we've done, um, how we've succeeded and failed, um, and kind of tips and tricks, because there's nothing like doing it yourself to um, both failing and succeeding to be able to share knowledge. Um, okay, next one. Let's see, we've got, so farmer circles is something that we've been able to partner with um, New Connecticut Farmer Alliance and CT NOFA. Um, they just started up in February. Um, and this is an opportunity for growers to learn together and get to know each other. Um, a term that, uh, so MC here and Robert Chang through NOFA are the two big supports to this effort. Um, and Dina Brewster at NOFA, I, I feel like coined the term for us, creating a Rolodex of farmers for each other that who are you going to call when something goes wrong? Who are you going to call to ask, you know, have you tried this before and did it go well? Is it worth buying that thing? Um, <laughs> and so these, these uh, there's some topics here that you see in front of you um, that are the ones that are happening this year. I hope that's a correct list, MC, I think it is. Um, and so it's a group of, um, well, any number of farmers from, I think we've got six up to 25 or so in these different groups um, and they meet 12 times a year, um, have a conversation around a topic that they've identified as important to them in their business um, and get to know each other. They can invite in a specialist if they want to. Um, and yeah, it's just a co-learning environment. Um, and then at the end of the year, New Connecticut Farmer Alliance hosts the Build Your Network Conference that MC talked about earlier. And that's a place where we hope these circles can present on their learning um, and how it's impacted them as growers and people, because we're also people. <laughs> um, so next we've got uh, the farmland mixers. So I'm sure you all know, I know well, we all know well, land access is one of the most uh, difficult and important topics for a new grower. Um, where are you gonna grow the food you wanna grow? 
Uh, so, so Land for Good is one of our other wonderful partners and um, Willow Mira at Land for Good hosts these farmland mixers, which are originally, we did manage to have one in person um, last year before COVID um, that was at literally a happy hour at a brewery. And it's an invitation to land seekers and land owners to come and get to get to having a conversation here from Land for Good, um, but also be able to say, hey, this is what I'm looking for and hey, this is what I have to offer uh, and hopefully build some relationships and get some, some new growers growing. Um, and there's just so much to land access. There's leasing, there's owning, there's um, you know land that's inherited, there's land that's uh, ready to grow on, land that needs clearing. So um, it's just a, beginning to a long conversation. Um, and so these are virtual now. Uh, we hope to be non-virtual in the future, but um, for now you can bring your own beverage and <laughs> they are on Zoom, which is, you know, the silver lining to COVID maybe is that everybody can come to all of these things slightly more easily. Um, you know, if you can, if you can bear to look at the computer anymore. But, um, the, you know, so we, we are hoping that um, people can come and, and, and meet each other this way too. Um, so there's another one coming up on April 6th. We had one already last month. It was very well attended. It was wonderful to see these little presentations by um, short kind of, and we can help you, Will will help you kind of uh, decide what you wanna cover in your pitch as a land, a land seeker, um, as well as a landowner. Um, and they're just kind of these short presentations and then breakout room sessions to meet each other more in depth. Okay, next one. Um, the urban ag programming is very exciting and not yet underway. Um, but, we, but in development. And uh, so that's a partnership with uh, three wonderful organizations, Green Village Initiative in Bridgeport, Park City Harvest in New Haven and Keeney Park Sustainability Project in Hartford. Um, they're all urban growing organizations. Um, and this will be um, a series of learning events. There will be two day sessions um, in all three of those locations. Uh, and they're about soil-based growing as well as soil-less growing systems. Um, but they're just very keyed into the um, opportunities and challenges of growing in an urban, urban setting. Um, and hopefully coming out of that with um, kind of a more robust uh, urban ag service provider network. Um, so networking growers together, but also providing them the services that they need or that are very specific to um, the ecosystems that they're working with. So more on that as it develops. Next one. Okay, so these are the three last iterations, or not iterations, three last areas that, we, that we're doing work in um, with Solid Ground. There will be a DIY farm infrastructure video series. Um, and that will look like, um, you know, we're all doing DIY projects on our farms. I've personally, you know, put up multiple high tunnels, built a walk-in cooler and a wash station. And, you know, you, you get that land, you, right, you work on the land access piece and then you get it. And what do you do with it? You've, there's, there's endless projects. So first you go to an ag mechanics training to learn your carpentry skills. And then you, <laughs> and then you watch the DIY video to uh, learn how to put up that, that building, that shed, that tractor run-in shelter. Um, so this is uh, literally me and Becca Toms, the communications coordinator, uh, going out to a farm who's putting up something new um, and taking a video and interviewing the folks doing it and um, watching them run into glitches and run out of glitches and <laughs> figure out how to do it. Um, and then posting that video for other growers to learn from. And they will also have some interviews with uh, growers doing the same project, but in very different contexts. So maybe a much larger or smaller scale farm, maybe urban versus rural, um, how, those, how those projects change with the context of your growing. Um, 
So there will be two of those every year. This is a three-year program that we're running um, that hopefully won't end after three years, but um, <laughs> that's what we've got keyed up. Um, then we have the new farm entrepreneur videos, and that's about um, kind of niche, more niche farming um, and kind of what's cutting edge in the ag area. You know, there's lots and lots of vegetable farmers, which is awesome, <laughs> and, uh, and fruit growers. Um, but what's a new niche thing that you might be interested in adding to your operation to be a little more profitable or diversify what you're doing. So this year, Nancy will be running those. Um, and this year she is going to be visiting a flower farm, a cut, cut flower farm um, in Newington. And also talking to that grower, Haley Billup at Eddie Farm about the Connecticut Flower Collective, which is a newly formed organization within uh, I think two years ago was their first year, um, and they are a wholesale outlet, a, a unique wholesale outlet for um, flower growers in Connecticut to connect with designers. Um, there was just such a such a lack of marketplace for um, for flower growers to sell and for designers to buy local, even if they wanted to. <laughs> um, so that's a neat new thing going on. And there's also um, she'll be working with videoing bottle farm on uh, on kind of unique meat production, small scale and interesting different kinds of meat. Um, so that's those are just examples she'll be doing. There's again, we'll be doing more videos going forward as well, but and that'll be produced by some um, actual videographers as opposed to my series, <laughs> which might be a little shaky, but um, <laughs> so then the last thing we have coming down the pike that's still kind of in um, formation phase is uh, learning modules with Kip Kolsinskis on soil health and climate change. And if you guys haven't heard the name Kip Kolsinskis, you will. He's a wonderful, um, just like wealth of information on soils. Um, and citing, so everything from, you know, citing your farm, is this good property to buy uh, for, for this kind of farming I wanna do, to um, analyzing your soils, to uh, citing your greenhouse on the best soils on your, on your plot. He, when I was looking to buy my farm, he, he came with me and my husband to, I don't know, six, seven properties, dug holes, <laughs> you know, squeezed the soil in his hand, showed us the, uh, the subsoils. Um, so just a really giving guy and a wealth of information. Um, he's also involved in the, um, the farmer mixers as well, um, but just because he has so much information about um, properties in, in the state. So um, those learning modules will also involve climate change and adaptation. So uh, how to not only mitigate climate change issues like drought and too much water, rain events, uh, storms that are that keep to, seem to keep happening, um, but also how to take advantage of things like suddenly it's warmer in Connecticut than it used to be. So what does that mean for growing uh, new crops, things we haven't been able to do before? Um, so we're really looking forward to releasing some of those that will be a combination of um, online learning and videos and um, maybe eventually some in-person learning. So that is the, the overview of Solid Ground. It's a really quite a, quite a multifaceted um, thing at the moment, uh, but we've got a great team working on it. You can go to our, on the next slide, you can go to, uh, well, you, first of all, you can email either me or Nancy with any questions or suggestions of topics, things that you can't find enough information on. Um, you can visit our website um, and go to the solid ground farmer trainings tab. I have that little picture is of what that looks like in their solid ground farmer trainings. And below it is the join our email list, um, which is the solid ground email list, um, where we just let you know about what's coming up and the calendar of events. Um, and I hope you can join us for some of these. We really are gearing all of this work towards networking beginner farmers and bringing them in to, you know, make use of extension, uh, extension experts, but also some of these trainings um, 
there's a lot out there for a new grower. I once was a new grower. <laughs> I don't come from a farming family. And as I said, I've taken, uh, you know, made use of some of these wonderful folks and programs along the way, and they've made me a better grower. <laughs> so hope to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. That was um, that was great. Um, I want to just introduce myself. I'm actually in Lebanon as well, so um, we're neighbors. My name's Mia. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you too. You too. Um, in terms of the schedule for some of these, it sounds like they are published like when they're coming, like maybe a, a couple of months in advance. Is there like a um, or are they planned out further than that? Is there like a calendar where you can make sure we save the date for some of the events? Yeah, if you go to that solid ground farmer trainings tab, there is a calendar on there. Mm -hmm. um, then we we kind of have tried to keep the kind of uh, develop them as series. So like the ag mechanics trainings, we have them planned out for the, the calendar year. Um, so did you just have one of those? I feel like I just missed one of those classes. Yeah, that's the one that's been the most actively ongoing. This this grant just got going last October. So, so as I was saying, some of the things haven't fully taken off yet. Um, but that one we've had four and we have one more coming up and then we'll start back up in September. So we do a lot okay. of programming in the off season so that farmers can attend. Um, so, yeah, so we try to we try to uh, market them as series. So you'll get the ag mechanics gambit, and then you'll get the agroecology series dates mm -hmm. um, as they come. Great, thanks. Sure. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Does anybody have any other questions for Charlotte or for any of our presenters today? Um, because that was Charlotte was the last. In the nick of time, there's only 29. <laughs> I, I can see about extension in Nepal. Um, the extension service exists in Nepal. It's under Department of Agriculture, not under universities. And that's the different, but there is extension office and extension office in every district and I used to work at one of those and I worked for five years uh, with uh, growers uh, in one district before I um, went to USA for my graduate education. So it's in uh, many, many countries. And I just wanted to mention on Thursday, there's going to be an on-farm composting webinar that Nancy Barrett is, um, I think, coordinating if people are interested about learning about on-farm composting. We have a really good speaker, James McSweeney. Yeah, thanks for the plug, Don. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone should go to that. <laughs> yeah, I went to the no-till one. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, will that be recorded as well? Yes, those will be recorded. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, and you'll find those on that, that solid ground site as well. Yeah, I think I actually registered, but I have a conflict, so I need to let them know. Yeah, no problem. All right, speaking of recordings, um, I'll send out the recording of this um, workshop tomorrow, as well as um, the slides and a bunch of the links that we talked about today. Um, and again, you can access the rest of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance um, series of workshops from this winter on our website. They're really a great resource. I, in moderating them, feel like I emerged with just like a set of skills um, that are pretty crucial for new farmers in Connecticut. Um, and yeah, thanks again to all of our presenters. I'm so excited that you all were able to come and lend your expertise and tell us about all of the things that you have to offer Connecticut farmers. And um, I, yeah, any last words from any of the presenters? Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Happy farming, happy spring. <laughs> thanks y'all, have a good night. Thank you, you too. Night. Night.
拜。